and recording. Welcome to Cedar Lane United Methodist Church Sunday School class. This morning, our teacher will be Bill Grindle, and we welcome him and turn, the, turn this lesson over to him. Thanks, Danny. Well, wisdom. I, I think it's something we still all look for, and uh, we're going to continue our study on wisdom, and today's lesson uh, uh, was very self-incriminating. Uh, of course, a lot of lessons are, especially when it comes to Proverbs. Things that we should be doing and should be natural to us that maybe we need a little bit of work on. Back in the day, back in the day, somebody who was considered wise really were held high in society. They were held high by the leaders and some of these leaders and kings actually reached out to people that they considered wise. Um, rather than wisdom from Proverbs, I would call that probably conventional wisdom. Uh, and, convention, and, and being able to tell whether somebody has conventional wisdom or not is, is a very subjective thing. So back in the day, wisdom or those who were wise it was, limited, it was limited to specialized classes of people, both men and women, who were either in the palace or in society. Well, obviously what we um, are talking about in Proverbs, this wisdom is not limited. It's not limited to a special class of people. It's available to everybody regardless of social class, position, whatever. But it's intended for everybody to live by and practice, again, regardless of their social uh, standing. Um, in Proverbs 30, 24 to 28, let me see if I have that real quick. Yeah, 24 to 28. Proverbs says that four things on earth are small, yet they are extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their home in the crags. Anybody know what a coney is other than a hot dog? <laughs> I didn't either, so I looked up. I looked up a coney. And a coney is a scraggly looking, white rabbit looking creature. And I guess why it's mentioned here as being in the crags, the reason it's wise is it can probably blend in pretty well with the landscape. So we've got ants and conies. And we have locusts. Locusts are wise because they can rule themselves. They have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. And finally, a lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Now that one, I, I kind of dwelled on that one a little bit. I said, what's so wise about that? Then I got to thinking, that lizard probably had to crawl up that wall to get inside a window to get inside the palace. So I guess what you could say is that uh, each one of these creatures had practical skills and uh, it helped them survive and thrive. And you probably know what I'm gonna say next. That's what God intends for us to do with these Proverbs is to survive and thrive. Wisdom is a whole lot more than somebody's intellectual ability which may have been the wisdom that they were looking for back in the, uh, back in the day, like I said. Um, but our practical knowledge of the Proverbs, if we apply that practical knowledge, we are guided through this journey we call life. And there are Proverbs for just about every occasion. And they instruct us on how to act, how to speak, how we should respond really in a wide variety of situations. Easier said than done, I understand. 
but we start at the starting point that we've been at through throughout our uh, study on Proverbs, and that is the, the definition of wisdom, which is, as we know, grounded in the fear of the Lord. And so that's where we're going to start today. And I have asked my trusty assistant, she's over here, I have asked her Already. to read Proverbs 8, 8 through 14 for us. Now? Now. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. To the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than, cho than choose go. Than choice. Wait a minute. Uh, let me start over on that one. Sure. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. Yeah, um, as I read those verses, the, uh, I mean, they are really pretty straightforward. Um, our author, uh, in his uh, commentary, draws out some things that I hadn't thought about, though. So I thought maybe we could highlight a few of those things. Um, so we're going to start with wisdom's words. That's what 8 through 14 is. And uh, then hopefully we'll have time to get to wisdom's wealth. Um, it says wisdom's words, but we've all heard words of wisdom, right? I mean, is there anybody that hadn't heard words of wisdom? I need the words of wisdom. Um, if we look at Proverbs 6 and 7, oh, excuse me, Proverbs 8, verses 6 and 7, uh, wisdom has been previously described as trustworthy, right, and true. And a similar uh, declaration is in, in this verse, verse, uh, verse 8. Wisdom's words are grounded in what is just. And it includes all of wisdom's words. And uh, wisdom says that it excludes any falseness, even from merely twisting the truth or omitting key details. So all the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. Verse 9 talks about to the discerning, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Gaining wisdom is not a complicated, high-level pursuit. Um, her ways are right to those who are discerning. We all know that words that are upright, positive, appeal to those of us who are guided by understanding and knowledge, the kind that comes from Proverbs 1-7, again, rooted in fear of the Lord. So there's pretty much no need to debate that. Now, 10 and 11 get into the uh, actual instruction and comparing the instruction and the words of wisdom to all the good things of the world or all of the things that are perceived as good things in the world. In this case, the words of wisdom are compared to fine jewels. So let's look at uh, wisdom as being the first of two choices facing a person. What are those two choices? Good and evil. <laughs> Absolutely. Choosing instruction versus the ways of the world. And I guess my interpretation is on these uh, fine jewels and gold and all of that, that that's just a way to show everything that's out there in the world that we can 
pass in terms of stuff if uh, if that's if that's our priority over wisdom. So it might be a uh, tough choice for some, but I think that you know we would agree that uh, we're after lasting value and genuine genuine pleasure and enjoyment. And that is what we get if we listen to the words of instruction uh, given by wisdom. Yeah, it seems like we're just, we're not just after the blame. No, no. We shouldn't be. No, we shouldn't be. <laughs> but have you seen all of the storage units going up, you know? <laughs> Very good point. Um, Mary, maybe you can help me with this. I looked at the uh, part B of, of 11, and Danny, you too. Uh, well, we got a lot of musical people on here. Um, there is a song out there that kind of says the same thing as 11B, not talking about wisdom, but talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And nothing you desire can compare with her. Now, here it's wisdom, but it's nothing you desire can compare with you. And I, I cannot remember the name of that song. Y'all know what I'm, the one I'm talking about? I don't know the name of it, but it, the words are, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Uh, Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more uh, beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. That's it. You know those words very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I you get a pass. You get a pass. That's about yeah. it. <laughs> You get a pass for not knowing the name of the song. I even I even went to the stupid uh, website that they they have a lot of for, for lyrics and things like that, uh, and put that in. And I still couldn't get it. So I can get it now because you've reminded me of some of the other words. <laughs> anyway, this part B here, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Our uh, author tells us that perhaps this is the boldest statement of today's lesson text. And it talks about, even back in the days, uh, in, in the biblical days, if you will, biblical times, there was still the desire for stuff. There were still folks that amassed stuff because back in that society, the more stuff you had, or even if the stuff was camels, you know, some people were satisfied <laughs> with their double hump camel while others you know were looking for a camel with three hunts just so that they could outdo each other that's not in the author's text i just kind of make that up but anyway the desire for stuff excuse me is there and especially very valuable stuff i guess it to some extent uh does what stuff does for us it sometimes makes us feel better about ourselves but then along with that comes buyer's remorse. So stuff is not it. Anyway, they, they had the same issue then, obviously, as we do. And it's, uh, um, and I found it interesting that uh, uh, the author talks about centuries later, Paul will have much to tell Timothy about the temptations associated with stuff riches so now we're going to talk a little bit about bringing discernment in verses 12 and 14 or 12 through 14 what do you think of when you hear the word prudence maybe old-fashioned somebody set in their ways what do you think of well, I think of somebody who, who never uh, rushes to judgment, always that's waits a, to get facts. That's a, that's a different way of saying exactly uh, what is uh, in our text, and that is prudence speaks of a person who is discerning and making choices, cautiously deciding what is right. So that's exactly right. And wisdom in this verse also claims to be familiar with discretion and in proverbs discretion is to protect the person who possesses it so 
I would say that uh, this verse 12 is maybe uh, highlighting wisdom's ability to provide one with the necessary insight to spot harmful influences or people when they're encountered and take steps to avoid them. Like Lewis said, you can't seek wisdom without understanding the difference in good and evil. And that's what this verse speaks to. Um, verse 13 repeats it, basically repeats, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. So the attitudes of pride and arrogance and perverse speech, all of those cited in this verse, they're all sins that are part of evil behavior. Our, uh, our author also points out that this is the only place in the Old Testament where the words pride and arrogance are used as synonyms. And uh, evil behavior can be built on pride and arrogance, for sure. Let's move to verse uh, 14. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. So the blessings that come out of seeking wisdom, including counsel and sound judgment, are insight and power. And sometimes insight and power can actually overthrow entire cities, especially back in the day. But uh, we're to use insight and power and adding it to our use of uh, just sound judgment. So many of these things, so many of these things are just so practical. Um, and we have to, I guess the other thing I learned in, in putting this lesson together is given all of our different temperaments and personalities and those kind of things, our interpretation of some of the, the verses here in Proverbs are going to be different than maybe somebody else's. Uh, my, my personality type, um, I know, and I've always dealt with this, I have a really, really tough time um, relating to somebody who is very prideful, pompous, or arrogant. Um, that just I mean, a little red flag goes up immediately if I'm in the presence of somebody like that. And I try to do, I try to do what my mom told me to do. Um, and she told me that her goal when she met somebody or was around somebody that was uh, difficult, that you always look for and try to find the good in somebody. And those are, if I may, no pun intended, very wise words. But uh, sometimes it's hard. And uh, I found it interesting that the author took a little bit uh, of time here. And I don't think this is in, in the student's book. So if, you, if you'll if you allow me, I'm just going to read it verbatim here. It's very interesting. And it talks about temperaments uh, a long time ago. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about uh, bodily secretions here. So, is everybody done with breakfast? No. <laughs> okay. Well, you it's think I see? Listen to this. Now, that, that's not my idea. That's that's right here. So, four centuries before Christ, Greek physician Hippocrates. We all know Hippocrates tried to explain why people have different temperaments. Now keep in mind, this was a long time ago. He hypothesized that personality, personality variations are related to internal secretions of one's body. The four temperaments, he, uh, 
he identified were caused by an imbalance of blood. He considered this a sanguine temperament, S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. Yellow bile is considered a choleric temperament. Black bile is considered a melancholic temperament. Now here's my favorite, phlegm, not F-L-I-M, P-H-L-E-G-M, phlegm as in <coughs> He considers that a phlegmatic temperament. What does that have to do with our lesson? Well, we're talking a little bit about temperaments, but listen to this, there's more. Using the ancient terms, a sanguine person is optimistic, active, and social. Wow. Choler choleric individuals are independent, decisive, and goal-oriented. Melancholics tend to be deep, very traditional, and orderly. Finally, a phlegmatic individual tends to be relaxed and easygoing. Hippocrates suggested that these characteristics were balanced in an ideal personality type with no one characteristic dominate. Well, Hippocrates was wrong. Now, if most of us have probably been through personality tests, and I mean, there are a million out there uh, to find out the personality type we are and who we best get along with and all of that. It's funny if you look at those that I read off, it's funny how if any of you had been through the test of a type A, type B, type C, type D, there, there they are. But centuries before Hippocrates, Solomon described godly wisdom as a balance of personality characteristics. Now, this is Solomon. And this is how he balanced them out. Wisdom and prudence coexist. Knowledge and discretion work together, as do insight and power. So the question posed to us is, have we found balance in wisdom? That's obviously a rhetorical question and something to think about. But that, from Solomon, was a long time before Hippocrates came up with his. But I, I just thought that's pretty interesting because they still have those tests out there out there and they are even they are even more uh, complicated than they used to be with the old type A, type B, type C, type D. But anyway, let's move on to uh, wisdom's wealth real quick. And I'm gonna get Elaine to read the uh, last of our, our verses here in Proverbs 8. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the path of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on all on those who love me, Sorry. <laughs> and making their treasuries full. Should we all be? Uh always be seeking wisdom. Looking for the type of wisdom that is in Proverbs and understanding the wealth, it's, it's not an idealistic, impossible dream walk. It's much within our grasp if we just lean on God. Sometimes it's hard to understand. A lot of the times it's very, very hard to practice. But in verse 18a, two words are used. With me, me being wisdom, are riches and honor. Riches and honor result from being obedient to what, the, uh, what wisdom is, uh, is saying. Um, some people, unfortunately, look at the promises of riches and honor that are associated with wisdom as an assurance that material wealth and prosperity will come to anyone who chooses to obey the Lord and live by his wisdom as found in scripture. That sounds great, but that's not practical wisdom. You really have to be cautious when something like that presents itself. 
And it, it tells us that the Proverbs and Scripture express principles that find fullest reward in eternity and do not always result in an easy life. And I think we know people, and it may be even some patch that we've been through ourselves, <coughs> where life ain't easy and I ain't rich. But that doesn't mean that these aren't practical words of wisdom. They are. You can't overlook, obviously, the role that human free will and sin have in impacting how certain proverbs actually play out with, uh, with people. I'm going to keep trudging. We've got uh, about three minutes. I'm going to roll out as much as I can. And when we get cut off, let me just say that uh, thanks for listening. And uh, I'm going to keep going with this wealth just a little bit, if that's okay. Um, one of the other things that, I, that was pointed out here was where a father um, <clears throat> might be imparting wisdom to his child. And the child may not be listening to that wisdom. Well, that's one of those situations where all you can do is depart that kind of wisdom to your children and what they do with it is what they do with it. But you can't go back and say that father must not have been a good parent. Father could have been an excellent parent. And we probably both know, know uh, situations like that. Um, One of the things I wanted, wanted to get to with regard to wealth, and this is uh, kind of part of, the, uh, con uh, part of the conclusion, and I'm, I'm skipping a bunch. I know that I only have two minutes, and I want y'all to hear this. You have one minute. <laughs> oh, okay. Speed mm -hmm. reading. Uh, this is something that's in the book that's not in your book. What happens to our wealth after we die? The usual answer is that it goes to our children. Some of the world's wealthiest individuals have different plans, however. Rock star Gene Simmons, yep, you're right, Kiss, Long Tone, that guy, he made his fortune with hard work. He wants his children to learn the value of work too, so they don't get daddy's wealth. Martial artist and movie star Jackie Chan plans to give most of his wealth to charity and not to his son. His logic is clear. If he's capable, he can make his own money. If he's not, then he'll be wasting mine. <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett has promised not only to give away 99% of his wealth, he's partnered with Bill Gates to persuade other super wealthy individuals to do the same. Most of Buffett's fortune will go to charities, not his children. These and other incredibly rich people have expressed a Solomon-like wisdom when it comes to inherited wealth. Solomon recognized that the best gift we can leave our children is wisdom, not cash. When we live a life of righteousness, we ensure that our children will have a rich inheritance, not a life of ease and irresponsibility. And with that, I bid you adieu. <laughs> well, I you know, so <laughs> Should we count down? <laughs>